one of the things that we talked about last week was the difference in the character in the Job story and the serpent that was in the garden saying that they were not one and the same. Uh, so we made this distinction between the serpent and Eden and the Satan figure that was in these other Old Testament passages that we kind of went through in Zechariah and Job and, and uh, places like that. But what what I what I did not intend, and I want to make this very clear because you heard this old saying, one of the devil's uh, the devil's biggest uh, what is it something like the devil's best trick is to convince people that he did he doesn't exist. That is not what I was saying. <laughs> so, and, and then we can we also talk later on in the presentation last week about how the the term Satan became a proper noun later on and that term got attached to the serpent that was in the uh in the garden so but we can't we what we don't want to say and what i was not intending or never will uh, intend to say is that satan doesn't exist because we know that satan is not a mythical being and the reason why we know it is because jesus said jesus called him by name uh if you turn your bibles to john 8 and 44 Jesus called him by name. He called him the devil by name uh, in John 8 and 44 when he was having a this knockdown dread. That John 8 is a great chapter, uh, a passage. It's a great chapter in, in the overall work of John, his, the overall book. This chapter right here, you can feel the tension in that chapter as you read through it because uh, he's just going back and forth with these Pharisees and with the Jews who were there claiming to be children of Abraham, so on and so forth. <clears throat> but what what last week was not intended to say that oh Satan doesn't exist or it's a he's a mythical being. No, that was not the intention. And and again, if Jesus called him out by name, then he got he has to be real, right? John eight and forty four. Uh, let me read forty three. He says, "Why why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say." Verse forty four. You belong to your father, the devil, and that. Diabolos in the Greek, but again, he's calling out the devil by name, right? So you know that this being who is considered like the ultimate malevolent being in the universe, you know he exists, right? Because Jesus called him out and said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry, uh, you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. So even Jesus is even describing him, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus is clearly explaining and describing who the devil is, right? So then you have a, the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, where Paul says, when he was talking about that thorn in the flesh, and he says, um, let, me, let me get to it real quick. He says in chapter 12 and verse seven, he says, I'll, I'll, um, I'll start at six. He says, even if I should, should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain so no one will think <clears throat> more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. He says, well, beca because of the surpassing uh, great, uh, because of these surpassing great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited or being puffed up, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. So again, you see that term, that proper noun now starting to stick in the New Testament. And then we already looked at the passage in, in uh, Revelation chapter 12, where John ties it all together. The, he calls him the serpent of old, the great dragon, Satan. Uh, he, he uses all these terms in, in, in Revelation 12. So it's definitely what we talked about last week not trying to say that the devil doesn't exist or Satan doesn't exist, or it's just how Satan or the devil was depicted in the Old Testament. We don't see that. We see more of the depiction of the modern depiction in the New Testament. Uh, and then Mark uh, 3 and 22, let's turn there real quick. And then we're going to jump in. Uh, I think I have another slide after this dealing with that term Satan in the Old Testament. And then we're going to <laughs> jump into our, our, what we're talking about this week. So Mark 3 and 22 says, and the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem 
said he is possessed by Beelzebub. And he says, by the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So again, you know that this character exists. You know that this being, this Elohim exists, right? So last week was not, not to try to erase that and say, he, oh, he doesn't exist. No, it's the terminology that's used in the Old Testament. You don't see that applied to the being that we know of in the New Testament, in the Old Testament. Again, the Satan in the Old Testament passages is a, a generic anonymous being, right? It can be any, any accuser, any prosecutor. Uh, and then what we gather from these Old Testament writings is that this specific being that we know of in the New Testament was not necessarily clearly known or identified. So that word evolved into a proper noun because of what the serpent did in the garden. Amen, amen. So let's let's go to, um, let's see, I think I got some in the chat. My understanding of Greek thorn, like a tent state. So Satan, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you're right, brother, brother Allen or Sister Tina, whichever one of you type that. Yeah, he was, and, and some, this is not verified. You don't know that, we don't know it from scripture, but the extra biblical literature says that, you know, Paul had a limp, but he was very frail. He was, uh, he was sickly and weak. And it's, you know, it's obvious that God was dealing with him to keep him from becoming arrogant uh, by giving him this tormentor, this messenger. And that's something uh, to say and, and for him to admit that and say as a messenger from Satan to keep him from being, keep him humble. Uh, and nothing keeps you humble, man, like an affliction. Well, I tell you what, you don't get, you don't get too big for your britches when you got to wonder every day, how, you know, what's coming, what, what type of pain I'm going to deal with today. I know I, I deal with that a lot. Like, what am I going to deal with today? What's going to be acting up today? Uh, yeah, so yeah, thank you for sharing that, man. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, so let's jump here to um, this next slide. And I just want to show you in the next slide, we were talking last week about uh, the Satan character or the Satan being, again, an anonymous character, an anonymous being, uh, but it's still an Elohim, still a divine being with, with power and supernatural, all of this stuff. But I want to show you something from Numbers 22 to kind of bring it all home and show that the term is, is simply a term that's used to indicate an adversary. So turn turn to Numbers 22. And again, I, I have the Hebrew text here. So I, I wanna show you a couple of things out of that. Uh, Numbers 22 and verse two. This is dealing with Balaam and his donkey. And uh, I just wanna show you this real quick. And then we're going to move on to this week, what we're doing this week. we got time to, to finish it. We'll have time to finish it. <laughs> Numbers 22 and verse 2. I'm going to read one and two. It says, uh, then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan. And it says, now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw that all Israel had done what it had done to the Amorites. Am I in the right place? Let me see. It's 22, not two. That's my fault. Numbers 22 and 22. It says this Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the Moabite officials, verse 22. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Now, I want you to see, you see what it says, stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were there, were, were with him. So if you look at Numbers 22 at the, at the Hebrew, original Hebrew text, you're going to see something, right? What you're going to see is the term Satan, right? It's like we talked about last week. And that term is used to describe the angel of the Lord because the, it says the angel of the Lord was standing there to oppose him as an adversary. So that's what a Satan is. It's a function. It's, it's not necessarily representative of the devil in the Old Testament but it's more of a functional term. So he was there as an adversary to oppose him, right? And if you look at the word, and it, the, the, this is the, the word as in Hebrew, just like we looked at the definite article last week. So again, it's a function. It's a, it's a word that's used 
to, the, to determine a function. But if you look at the word itself, right, it's the same word translated as an adversary. And if you compare it to the, to the same word in Zechariah 3 and 2, I just, I just want to make this point. If you look at the, the word in Hebrew, it's the exact same word. You can see the spelling, the, the Hebrew lettering, all of that is the same. So it's, no, it, it's, it's just a term that's used to denote a function, at one who is an adversary, one who is a prosecutor, one who, who is a, uh, an opposer, right, in the Old Testament. But again, if it kind of evolved to the term that we know now that we attach to the serpent and that we're attached to the devil. So I just wanted to make clarify from last week to make sure we were all on the same page. Uh, Cause when I got done, uh, I felt like there might've been a little bit of confusion. So I didn't want to, I mean, one, the good thing about being a teacher is that if you sense confusion, you can always come back and say, hey, we're gonna, let's clarify. So that's, that's that was the goal of this. So now we already we asked these questions last week, uh, talking about God's foreknowledge and predestination and sovereignty and free will. So the question last week we asked was if God foreknew everything. We were talking about the fall and revisiting the fall and the serpent and all this stuff. And if God foreknew everything, did He also predestine everything? That was the question. And the next question was if everything was predestined, then does free will even exist? <clears throat> and then the third question was, how can Adam and Eve be held responsible for the things that they were predestined to fall into if everything was uh, predestined? So that's where we left off last week for us to kind of chew on those questions. And those questions are going to guide us into what we talk about this week, which is dealing with, you know, God's sovereignty, his foreknowledge, uh, predestination, and, and free will, right? So I have a question. Does divine foreknowledge or does God knowing all things equal predestination? So if you saw if you saw the Avengers, Infinity Wars, I think it was, it was the last Avengers movie. Uh, that was a scene in the movie where they were fighting Thanos. Thanos is this man, he's a real gangster. <laughs> that's, all, that's the best way I can describe him. He's a real, a real gangster. But anyway, they're fighting him and they have He's trying to get these stones for this uh, for this glove, this gauntlet that he had on his hand. So one of the stones he needed was the time stone. And I'm not I'm not in any way saying that Doctor Strange, who's pictured here with the time stone, is God. No way. But but the uh, but the concept that we're going to be dealing with it kind of it ties in, right? So Doctor Strange has this time stone, and what he did was he was able to look at every possible outcome of a battle they were getting ready to go and, and undertake. And that was, that was only one outcome where they won out of billions of possibilities that could happen. Only one outcome had them winning. And so the, the idea is that with foreknowledge and predestination, the question is whether that, that whether divine foreknowledge or God knowing everything equals the, the predestination of all things, right? So the, the, here, here's the thing. Hold up, I saw something come in the chat. Yeah, great movie, great movie, great movie, uh, Sister Dan. Yeah, I love that movie. Uh, and, and man, those those are re those movies really make you think. Uh, they really do. I, I I really enjoyed that movie. And and the question is whether divine foreknowledge, because we know that God is omniscient and he knows everything before it happens equals predestination. And the answer that Heiser gives, and I, I tend to agree with him here, is no. God, what he says is God can know every single possible outcome of a situation, including the ones that don't happen. We're gonna back that up with some scripture in a minute, but including the ones that don't happen. Now, I, I want you to think of this in, in a very practical sense. All of us, that are on here right now have made decisions where we, after we make that decision, if it, especially if it turns out good, we also consider what could have happened that didn't happen. Every, everybody here has had a situation like that. I, I'll give you a, an example for me. I had a friend of mine. Well, I don't know how much of a friend he was, but he was a, uh, a guy that lived in our neighborhood and he, he, was on drugs. And uh, one day 
he offered me, he was smoking uh, what we call moles, right? You take, you take a marijuana, you take a, a, a rock, a cocaine, crush it up over the marijuana, roll it up. He was smoking old. So one day he asked me if I wanted to smoke with him. And I knew he smoked moles. I never smoked weed. That's not, that wasn't never me. But I knew he smoked moles. And, and one day he asked me, say, hey, uh, do you want to smoke with me? You ought to come and smoke with me. I told him, no, I, I don't get down like that. But the idea is that that scenario had multiple probabilities. Like that could have happened. I could have smoked with him. I could have got addicted to crack, could have got addicted to whatever. And my life would have went down the tubes or I could make it the decision to say no and have a different outcome. So when we think about it like that, there are a lot of different outcomes that are possible and some outcomes don't even happen. But God knows every single outcome, even for situations that don't happen. And, and, and that foreknowledge doesn't necessarily mean that an outcome is predestined. Because the fact that I said no, that don't necessarily mean that it was predestined for me to say no. What it means is that God already knew if what would happen if I said yes or what would happen if I said no. That's the point I'm trying to make. So he can know the beginning and the end, but not... Don't, don't misconstrue this. I'm not saying he doesn't know how the middle will occur. It's just that he may or may not predestine how the middle occurs. Because, you know, he said it himself in, in the uh, book of Isaiah. He says, I am, uh, I'm the one, I, I know the end from the beginning. So he already knows the outcome. And he already knows how things are going to start. But the middle part may or may not be predestined. Like things can change and shift it. If you want, a, want an example of that, think about Jesus, how uh, the scripture says he came down through 40 and two generations and how many characters in his lineage were rebellious against God, you know, harlots, uh, all types of different people, right? And you think about Jacob being a swindler. You think about Abraham lying to uh, to a king, of, uh, which king was it? The, um, I can't, can't think of the name of the king that he lied to about Sarah, but all of these things happen, not necessarily, that, and it's not so necessarily so that they were predestined. The middle part happens. Sometimes it may, it may, the event may have been predestined, other times it may not have been predestined. But if something is foreknown, that doesn't mean that it's predestined. So what, what am I saying? that Adam and Eve's sin was not predestined by God. I, if that was the case, that's not a very loving thing to do. <laughs> I mean, that's not very loving to set them up to fail. And then the consequence, the wages of sin being death, so you set them up to fail, and then you make the consequences for sin death after you force their hand. That's not love. So the, 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 the sin or the fall of Adam and Eve was not predestined. And if you're working from the handout, this is under number five, sovereignty, foreknowledge, predestination, and free will. And the first question was under letter A, 5A, was the fall predestined by God, right? But, but God can know, again, the beginning and the end and not predestined how the end comes about. All right, let's look at let's look at some scripture here. Let's take um let's look at um mouse is always acting up. All right, let's look at uh first Kings chapter 20. Again, we're going back to first Kings chapter 20 because that's a great passage passage of scripture. It makes the point very plain. First Kings chapter 20. First Kings 20 and verses 20 through 23. Right. So let's look at that real quick. It says, uh, <clears throat> let me find it right quick. I got it. 19. Uh, I'll start at 19. It says the junior officers under the provincial commanders marched out of the city with the army 
behind him. And it says in verse 20, and each one, make sure I'm in the right place, struck down his opponent. Hold up. Let me make sure. Am I in first Kings or second Kings? Together, Russell. First Kings 22 was right down the handout too. I'm going to get my mind right one day. First Kings 22. Let me start at verse 19. It says, Micaiah continued, therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left, verse 20. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? And one suggested this and one suggested that. And it says, finally, verse 21, a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. Verse 22 says, by what means, the Lord asked. So you can see right there, the death of Saul was foreknown, right? God had already ordained that. Saul would die, but the method, how he would die, the middle, we knew the end, we know the beginning too, because Saul, uh, I'm sorry, not Saul, uh, Ahab, there should be Ahab on the, um, on the handout too, not Saul, but Ahab, his death was already foreknown, and at th the reason is because Ahab had, he was, he was played that harlotry game, right, he led the people into idolatry, Jezebel was there and you know they had these false prophets of, of Baal and all this other stuff so his death was foreknown how that would happen was not it wasn't it, not that it wasn't foreknown but it wasn't predestined it wasn't predestined that this spirit this uh, spirit would become a uh, lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets because if it was then this conversation would never have happened it's not that God didn't know but how Ahab would die was not predestined, right? It was, it was not set in stone. So this is how that came about. This is how the end came about. So that, that middle part between his harlotry, his idolatry, uh, God's displeasure with him, and eventually God's decree that he would die, all of that happened at the, at the beginning. And in the middle, as far as like between that and his death, how it would happen, it wasn't predestined, right? If it, if it was predestined, God would have said, you, we would have called that spirit out. You come and you go be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. But God said, who will entice Ahab? And this spirit stepped forward. So his death was foreknown, but it wasn't necessarily predestined how he would die. So that's, again, going back to the original point. God can know the beginning and the end and not predestined how an event will occur. It's not saying he doesn't know how it's going to occur. It's just saying that he doesn't necessarily predestine how it's going to occur. And there are some events that are predestined, some that are not. That's the point. Uh, let's look at another uh, pastor scripture. Let's look at uh, John 17 and 11. John 17 and verse 11. What I, what I don't want you to to leave thinking is that there's something that God can't know because God knows everything. So that's not the issue. The issue is whether he predestined how it's going to happen. Uh, John 17 and verse 11. I'll read 10. It says, all I have is yours and all you have is mine and glory has come to me through them. He's talking about his disciples. <laughs> verse 11. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name given, uh, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. And verse 12 says this, uh, while I was with you, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe uh, by that name that you gave me. None has been, this is the, the part I'm trying to get to right here in verse 12, none has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture will be fulfilled, right? So that's saying something. That's saying something about Judas, who was the one doomed to destruction. His destruction was foreknown, right? Was it predestined? It's quite possible that it was predestined uh, because other prophecies speak to 
what he was going to do. We're going to look at that in a second in Zechariah 11, what he was going to do, even how he was going to do it. His greed was foreknown. The amount that he took, 30 pieces of silver, that was even foreknown. Turn to um, uh, Matthew 27, verses, let's look at verses 6 through 10. Matthew 27, 6 through 10. Look at what it says. It says, the chief priest picked up the coins and said, it is against, this is after they paid Judas to, <clears throat> to uh, betray Jesus. And Judas came back and tried to give them the money back. And it says, the chief priest picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So they knew, they even knew. Isn't that something? They didn't want to take the money back because it was blood money, but they were willing to pay it pay blood money to Judas to betray Jesus. Ain't that so? That's so hypocritical. But that's just me. Uh, it says, so they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. Verse 9, that is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. And then uh, verse 8, verse 9 says this, then what was spoken by Jeremiah and the prophets was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. So again, you can see even Jeremiah had prophesied that, but even further than that, Zechariah also prophesied. So let's turn to the book of Zechariah, 11th chapter, and the uh, 12th and 13th verses. It says in verse 12, I told them, if you think it is best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. It says, so they paid me 30 pieces of silver. <clears throat> and the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. So now you see again that connection between the pieces of silver and the potter, just like with Jeremiah, just like uh, the scripture says what happened. They took the money and they bought the potter's field after Judas brought the money back. Uh, it says, so I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter at the house of the Lord, right? So again, the betrayal of Judas was foreknown. His destruction was foreknown. And many, many commentators even said, say that it was predestined. That's why Jesus called him the one doomed to destruction, the son of perdition. So, uh, and if, if you ever heard of these uh, lost gospels, one of those lost gospels is the gospel of Judas which tries to rehabilitate his image. Uh, and I've never read it, but I've heard about it. Uh, let's look at one last passage of scripture here. Uh, and this is going to kind of tie it all together because with, with David went to Kalia or Kalia, one of the things that that's um, really telling from this passage of scripture is that there was a lot of outcomes that could have happened, but none of them happened. So let's look at that real quick. First Samuel, Chapter 23. Let me turn in this. First Samuel 23. <clears throat> and verse, it says, verses 1 through 13. Right? So, uh, so it says, when David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Goliath and are, are looting and the threshing floors. He inquired of the Lord. So David is asking God. Shall I go and attack these Philistines? The Lord answered him, go attack the Philistines and save Goliath. Verse three, but David's men said to him, here in Judah, we are afraid. How much more then if we go to Goliath <clears throat> against the Philistine forces? So in verse four, once again, David inquired of the Lord and the Lord answered him, go down to Goliath for I am going to give you the Philistines into your hand. Verse five, so David and his men went to Goliath, fought against the Philistines and carried off their livestock. So you can see uh, right up front, God has already predestined the outcome. He says, and it's foreknown. He says, go, I'm gonna give them into your hands, right? So that outcome was predestined. No, no question about that. <clears throat> and then it says in verse six, uh, well, actually let's go to verse seven. It says Saul, now remember Saul and David are mortal enemies at this point. It says Saul was told that David had gone down to Goliath and he said, look at what he says, God has delivered him into my hands. But David has imprisoned himself by entering, entering a town with gates and bars. 
Verse 8, and Saul called up his forces for battle to go down to Kaliah to besiege David and his men. So now we got another possibility, right? This attack was fought on. God knew this. When he told David, go, I'm going to give them into your hands. God knew omnisciently that Saul was coming to attack. When David, look at what it says, verse 9. When, when David learned that Saul was plotting against him, he said to Abithar, the priest, bring the ephod. Verse 10, David said, Lord God of Israel, your servant has heard definitely that Saul plans to come to Kaliah and destroy the town on account of me. Verse 11, look at the question. Will the citizens of Kaliah surrender, to me, surrender me to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Lord God of Israel, tell your servant. So now David is asking another question. God, is Saul coming and all these people going to turn me over to him? And look at what it says. And the Lord said, he will. So the answer to David's question is, yes, Saul is coming and he's going to attack. And it says, and the Lord, and, and then uh, it says, will the again, David asks in verse 12, will the citizens of Kaliah surrender me to, and my men to Saul? And the Lord said, they will. So these are possible outcomes, right? But then if you look at verse 13, it says, so David and his men, about 600 in number, left Kaliah. And they kept moving from place to place. And then it says, when Saul was told that David had escaped from Kaliah, he did not go there. So the possibility, the foreknowledge of Saul coming to attack David was there, but the outcome didn't happen because David left before Saul could get there. So Saul didn't even come. At the outcome of the people turning David over to, and his men over to Saul didn't happen. And so, again, God can know every possible outcome, whether it's predestined or not, or whether it happens or not. He can know every possible outcome. That's why I use that analogy of Dr. Strange at the very beginning. All the different probabilities and possibilities God knows omnisciently. And so what the dot little diagram is, is, is kind of tying, trying to tie everything together. So you have God who's sovereign. Uh, you have God who has this omniscience, this foreknowledge. He's omnipotent, so he's all-powerful. So anything that he says, it, it has to happen. And then he, uh, in his sovereignty, he gives his imagers, divine and human, free will, right? And in our decision-making, our decisions have outcomes. The question to, as to whether or not those outcomes are predestined we don't know. Sometimes they may be, sometimes they may not be. But what we do know is that every outcome is foreknown, right? Every outcome is foreknown, but God knows the, the end from the beginning. There's nothing that he can't know. But whether those outcomes are predestined by God, we, we don't know if, if they are or if they aren't, right? He knows the beginning, he knows the end, but the pathway from begin, beginning to end, although he may know it, he may not necessarily predestined it. And so all of this said, all of that to say this, <clears throat> that the fall was not necessarily predestined by God. And, and not only that, the decision that was made in the garden, God already knew what the decision was going to be. But that doesn't mean that he predestined that decision. What he did predestine is the remedy to the fall he he he, pre, he predestined the christ to be the remedy for sin that was predestined because we scripture calls jesus the lamb who was slain from before the foundation of the world he said he had glory from before the foundation of the world so that is predestined that was predestined before the fall ever happened right but whether or not uh god predestined the fall that we don't believe that. I don't believe that. I, I think that it was a decision that was made and, a, and the outcome of that decision had ramifications that God knew would happen because of us having free will, because of the serpent who was a divine being having free will, decisions were made and outcomes happened. All right. Uh, so the takeaway is this, if everything is predestined, then nobody can really be held responsible for their actions because 
it's almost like you're a robot. If I go in there and turn the my little uh, sweeper on, uh, my iRobot, and I turn it on, and I tell it, program it to get stuck under the couch, and then I go in there and get upset because it's stuck under the couch. How can I be upset? I'm the one who programmed it to do that. And so without, without uh, free will, human beings having free will, that means we're just programmed to do whatever, right? So I, we, let, me, let me see what the next section, I don't wanna start this next section yet because we are seven minutes over, but I, I will open the floor up for a couple of minutes. Let's have some, some feedback, some Q and A. What do you think about that? And, and about the, the sovereignty of God as it relates to free will and foreknowledge and predestination and his omnipotence. Any, anybody have a, uh, any thoughts about that? You can unmute or you can put uh, something into the chat. Let me see, I just saw something pop up. Thank God, thank God, thank God. I saw a message that said, uh, well explained. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I give God glory for that. Uh, Sister Raquel said, you've been battling with this. Amen. 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 Thank you. I, see, the Holy Spirit knows exactly what we need. So uh, that, that, now that is God and his foreknowledge setting, setting it up, right? So that we can get what we need. That's why the, the login worked. The storm didn't knock the Wi-Fi out because somebody probably needed to hear what that what was being said amen and, Pastor and, Rosa, this yeah, is Yvette. I, She's Yvette I feel like we do still and I thank God he gave us free will let me say that just to start off mm -hmm. um just with the experience of what my family just recently went through yes I sit sometimes and I was exhausted I'm exhausted when I get off we're doing overtime and it's like Thank God I got a job. Thank God we're doing overtime. So many people don't. And I'm like, you're going to Bible study, you're going to Bible study. And it always fills me back up from where I've been depleted and sitting here listening to you talk. We've experienced when my father passed, my stepmother lost her best friend, half of her heart for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. And it amazes me to hear people say, oh, well, the money and cars that people are giving you, that's for you. And I'm thinking, no, it's not for me. You right. know, she lost something, you know, we're here to support her. And it's like, you have that free will. You can listen to, and I don't think they mean, they don't mean, you know, to be ill about it, Yeah. but you're not really thinking of what we are supposed to do here as followers of Christ to love on each other, support each other. And the Bible says, take care of the widows. You know, yeah. and the first thing that I'll hear people say, well, she's not your mother. I'm like, that's my bonus mother. Yeah. So yeah. I thank God he gives me the free will that I can listen to feedback and still, because I have the Holy Spirit in me, know to mm. do the right thing. Yeah. And know that, you know, me and my father were close, very close. He would never want me to sit here and not take care of his spouse that he loved on for over 30 years. I'm like, I do thank God for free will because yeah. if we didn't have it, we'd be all over the place. And not <laughs> only that, she's still your neighbor. She might she not be is. your mother, but she's your neighbor. And That's my love family. Love your neighbor yes. as you love yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. So for somebody to try, and, and I wish we had time to do this now, but I, I don't want to do it because I want to go too far over but we're gonna talk about that. How how <laughs> how people are influenced. What what are certain influences on humanity? And bad human imagers are a source of yes consternation, <laughs> and, and they can influence us in wrong ways. Uh, and we're like, sitting here thinking, what what you know, unspiritual or you know, the spiritual realms? Who got in their head to say, hey, don't tell exactly. me that? Keep that money in your pocket exactly. instead of giving. Exactly. Like, who's right. influencing you? That's right. That's right. We're going to actually, we're going to hopefully we'll get a chance to get to that next week. Uh, but we're going to, we're going to get to that and, and we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it because it's really important to understand the, the influences that are around us, both spiritual and yes. human. Yeah. Great, great point though. Great point. Hey, Pastor, I was just going to throw in real quick. Um, if, if God predestined everything to happen the way it happened, it would be against his character because he would just be a puppet master exactly. and not somebody that loves. Exactly. That's exactly right. 
That's exactly right. And that's, and that's not God. God is not a puppet master. God is, God desires fellowship, not dictatorship. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's so, it's so odd that, you know, people, and that's why a lot of people don't want to come to Christ because they think it's like a dictatorship when yes, God has rules, boundaries, don't get me wrong, but God desires a fellowship. That's why he created us to commune with him, to fellowship with him. Uh, so you are absolutely right about and that. The rule, and the rules and boundaries he sets is for our good, not for, for our good. Our exactly, exactly. Just like you set rules and boundaries for your kids. That's right. Yes. <laughs> that's exactly right. Uh, yes. That's exactly right. And, 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 and that's the thing that uh, people don't understand like some, you need some boundaries. You can't just be lawless. <laughs> you can't just do, you know, everything under the sun because everything is, you know, not beneficial. And then Paul said that way, uh, all things are, what do you say? All things are, are, are possible, but all things are not beneficial. I think something to that effect. Uh, you can do whatever you want to do, but everything is not going to benefit you. That's, I'm paraphrasing that. Uh, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's why a lot of people back away because they, they see this uh, conception of God as a puppet master, as a evil, malevolent being, which God can't be evil because he's, God is love. <laughs> but we're going to talk about that next week. We're going to talk about it next week. Uh, we, I, I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to talking about that next week. So, yeah. This is good. Any other questions or comments? Uh -huh.